Welcome. Welcome. Can you take your seat? I, I hope there are seats for everybody. Um, I'm Andrea Montanino. I'm the director of the Global Business and Economics Program here at the Atlantic Council. And I'm delighted to see that so many of you could join us today. Along with Peter Schechter, which is the director of the Adrian Ashton Latin America Center, I'm very pleased to be able to host this discussion with our distinguished panelists. Today's event is titled Reforming the Future, Lessons from Soaring Debt Restructuring. Because Peter and I recognize that the event in the news today and yesterday in Europe, Latin America and elsewhere stem from both the short-term contingent reasons as well as longer-term ones. On the short term, everybody knows that today is the day of the repayment uh, by the Greek government to the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and there is approximately 7 billion euros of government bonds to be reimbursed by July and August, and 2 additional billion, if I'm not wrong, to the IMF in June, July. So the question on the minds of many is whether we will see another Greek default, and what potential consequences this could have on the stability of the international financial markets, the Euro and Europe. But Greece is not the only country in the news. Ukraine is currently negotiating its debt restructuring as a key component of the completion of the IMF review of their new program. A failure to get an agreement with creditors could put the program off track, given the hurdles for the Ukrainian government's path to reform. And, of course, Argentina. Argentina and the long, difficult legal situation with its creditors has been a headline for many months. So it is clear that sovereign debt issues are important today, but they will be even more important tomorrow. And we want to really look at the future rather than just at the past. Economies around the world, many with historical peaks of public debt, are more connected than ever through trade and financial investment, at the same time that the world is becoming more diffuse, destabilized, fragmented. So all these issues contribute to increased instability, whose effect goes beyond individual countries and touches the role of international organizations like the IMF. It is also quite clear that sovereign debt issues influence and frame global and regional politics. This is not only true in Europe, but take Latin America, where almost 600 million people are moving to the middle class and are already in the middle class citizens. So I'd like to say a couple of things about today's discussion. First, it will be the first of many others of, on these issues. Me and Peter and the Atlantic Council are convinced, and by the turnout today, it seems that you are too convinced, that this is a major global issue without black and white answers. We at the Council will try to shine light on the different use of the problem. Second, we are very grateful for our experienced panel of speakers. It is a uniquely diverse panel as well, and probably for the first time we have on the same stage a debtor country, the IMF, and a leading private financial institution together. Unfortunately, there was a last minute change in the constellation of our panel, and Mr. Pablo Lopez, Secretary of Finance of the Republic of Argentina, won't be able to join us today. But we are happy that the Argentinian government will be represented by Ambassador Nahon. Third, today's session is not only about Argentina or Greece or Ukraine, it is about sovereign debt and future challenges for its restructuring. It looks at the past to find new venues for the future. We really want to look at the architecture of sovereign debt restructuring rather than looking at specific countries. So this is also about Mexico 1994, Russia 1998, Pakistan 1999, Iraq 2004, and many other countries throughout the world. So with that, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, Joe Stiglitz, university professor at Columbia and Nobel Prize winner in economics. He has been a tireless advocate in the public sphere as well, advising policymakers and governments for many years. And his most recent new book, I do some advertisement, uh, 
The Great Divide, an equal society and what we can do about that is already a bestseller, but we can continue to buy, of course. Schoenigen, Schoenigen is a friend and the general counsel and director of the legal department of the International Monetary Fund. He led the recent IMF effort on suggesting proposals for the future debt restructuring. And he's a leading world expert on prevention and resolution of financial crisis with a particular emphasis on insolvency and the restructuring of debt, including sovereign debt. Cecilia Neon is the ambassador of Argentina to the United States. Previously, she served as Secretary of International Economic Relations, as well as serving as Argentina's Sherpa to the G20. She was also Under Secretary of Investment Development at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina. Martin Peterman is the Managing Director and Head of the Special Situations Group for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at J.P. Morgan Chase. He had a key role in many negotiations in the Greek debt restructuring and joins us from London uh, today. With that being said, I will hand over to Sam Fleming, who will be the moderator of today's discussion. Sam is the US economics editor for the Financial Times, covering US economics, financial markets, and business, as well as the Federal Reserve and the US uh, Treasury. So please join the stage. Well, thanks very much indeed, Andrea, for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming along to listen to this fascinating uh, panel and fascinating topic. Uh, back in the 19th century, people used to send gunboats to enforce sovereign debt crises. Today, they are more likely to send lawyers and district court uh, judges. Uh, but the process hasn't changed in one way, uh, and that is that it tends to be extremely messy uh, and incredibly contentious. Uh, and so one of the key uh, agenda items we want to talk uh, about today is the idea of whether there could be ways of making the sovereign debt restructuring process a more uh, orderly one, especially in the context of rising uh, public uh, sector uh, debt to GDP ratios around the world. Um, I'm going to start um, to my far left uh, with uh, Professor Stiglitz. Joe, thanks very much for uh, joining us. Can I um, get a little bit of background as to why you have um, quite publicly backed the idea of a UN, uh, UN backed idea of a treaty mechanism uh, for sovereign debt restructuring? I mean, first, I mean, let me say a few words about why the issue is so much on the fore, besides the fact that so many countries are about to go bankrupt. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the basic thing is that. Uh, no country could really have a debt market without a bankruptcy law. I mean, back in 97, 98, when I was at the World Bank, uh, World Bank and IMF were telling countries all over the world that they ought to have a bankruptcy law. We don't have international bankruptcy law. Uh, we don't have a rule of law for dealing with the uh, question of what happens when a country owes more money than it can pay. And that can, situation could arise not because of any malevolence, uh, you know, any bad behavior, just when you borrow, as, as one of our defense secretaries said, stuff happens. And, and sometimes those things are negative and you wind up uh, m more in debt than you can repay. So the question is what happens. Uh, as you said, historically, uh, we had an easy way of settling it. You send in gunboats. Uh, and uh, that settled the, the issue, but it wasn't really, it's not really a 21st century way of, of doing things. So um, what has made things, let me just point, three things that made things much worse in recent years. Uh, the first is that we've moved from bank markets, banks as lenders to uh, market security, you know, bonds. Uh, back in the uh, Latin American crisis uh, in 1980, you can put a few people in a room, hammer it out, uh, and uh, with a, a little bit of twisting by a few governments uh, of, of the arms of, of some of the banks, and they went along. Uh, today, you couldn't have a room big enough for all the, the creditors, so that's one change. The second change is, is one that's not fully appreciated is the growth of CDSs. Uh, 
And CDSs are important because the people at the table, the bondholders, may have no inter economic interest in the outcome. They may have an adverse, they, they may have an interest actually not having a settlement because they may get paid more than they may do better without a settlement than they do with a settlement. And we saw that sort of in the Greek issue. Nobody knew what was going to happen in the first restructuring. And it got so perverse that the ECB, the European Central Bank, preferred that the restructuring be a, 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 a uh, mild one in which the CDSs didn't pay off rather than uh, a deep one that, where they did pay off because they didn't know what was going to happen. So the CDS just is a big change. And the third really big thing, and the reason this is so much on the table, is a district court, Judge Grisa, made a very, what I think is a very peculiar decision. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm an economist in terms of what the law ought to be, not what the law is, but the law ought to be. It was very peculiar. And basically, that his decision made it almost impossible to get a fresh start, almost impossible to restructure debt. And so we have a real problem. And uh, an in, a resolution was introduced into the UN to try to create what I would call an international rule of law in this area, um, to start a process of discussion. And uh, it's gotten uh, almost unanimous support from emerging markets in developing countries, and perhaps not surprisingly, uh, opposition from the United States. Uh, just to give you a background a little bit, just one more second on, on Judge Grease's decision, uh, it, it went all, all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, 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 appeals were filed by other countries that were not necessarily Franks, uh, friends of Argentina, but they, were, they really thought it was important to have an international rule of law that worked. Uh, even many people, uh, there, there were filings from, I think, the American Bankers Association, and I mean, uh, because his decision really undermines America's financial markets. So it was a suit where some people in American financial markets gained, but the vast majority were losing. So it was a really peculiar suit. Sean, we've, we've been here before in terms of the idea of a, of a global sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. In fact, the IMF proposed one uh, about 14 years ago. It didn't happen because of the um, opposition of one prominent country, the US. Um, that opposition is present today, again, in terms of the UN process. Uh, what, what, is there an alternative? OK, so um, it is interesting that the discussion of the architecture on sovereign debt seems to come in waves and not surprisingly follows major debt restructuring, like in Greece. Um, and it is true that about 14 years ago, we, um, in fact, following the Argentine restructuring, there was a major international debate about uh, the issues that Joe has raised, which was, do we need to have a more structured, orderly framework for restructuring debt? And the fund took this debate seriously and proposed a statutory framework that was very loosely based on Chapter 11, but essentially was a framework that involved an amendment to the IMF's articles that would enable a majority of creditors to make decisions that are binding on all creditors. Um, as was indicated, it was a proposal that was discussed extensively, but in the end, it wasn't just the United States, but a number of the emerging markets did not support it as well because of their concern that it would increase the cost of credit. Um, that didn't stop work on this issue. And what we did is we uh, ended up looking at alternative legal frameworks to achieve the same objective, which is to bind all creditors to an agreement reached by a majority. Okay? And we worked on that with the market, and they're called collective action clauses. So you replicate the legal framework from a statute into a contract. And of course, it only applies in future contracts. Um, but there are limitations to that approach, which were, in some respects, in play during the Greek restructuring, which was that these clauses only bind the holders of a particular instrument. So holdouts can essentially 
block the operation of these provisions by obtaining a holdout position. And then essentially, you can have a situation where you don't actually have a 100% you know, participation. So one of the initiatives that we've been uh, undertaking, again, in consultation closely with the market, is to come up with clauses that aggregate the voting across all instruments. And we've had an extensive outreach on this issue. We've agreed with the International Capital Markets Association on a set of provisions which actually now have been introduced uh, into bonds governed by both English law and by New York law. Now, is this a panacea? No. Why? Because it doesn't apply to the existing stock. And there is a significant existing stock, approximately 900 billion worth, governed by New York and English law. So, you know, public policy often is a more incremental than we would like, and, but I think it is an important step forward. I would emphasize, Sam, that the whole issue of addressing collective action problems is an important issue, but from our perspective, it's only one issue. There is a, you can look at the collective action issue as being the problem that you need to address at the end of the process, when you've reached an agreement and you need to bind in everybody. From our perspective, a critical problem is the beginning of the process, which is that we think that debt restructurings should not be the norm, they should be exceptional, but when they are necessary, they should happen rapidly. They should happen early because delay actually is bad for the debtor, it's bad for the creditors, and it's bad for the system. And our, our concern is that we do not have an effective trigger, as you would like. And we're, we're engaged in intensive discussion within the fund about how to you know, make a trigger more effective, and we can talk about that, we but can, I'll let the others Absolutely. Well, first. let's, let's, let's um, talk a little bit about the idea that um, debt restructurings under the trigger, and certainly under the UN process, potentially could happen more often. Is that, Martin, is that something that you as a market practitioner worry about, that uh, the thrust in terms of the IMF and the UN seems to be that perhaps countries need to be given the opportunity to get out of their problems more readily? Well, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> yes, debt restructurings are messy. And in my view, they will always be messy. It's like a divorce. You know, you can make the nicest framework around it, but it's still going to be messy because there are a lot of people involved. I think there are a lot of lawyers involved which complicate matters. So from that perspective, I don't think you're going to have a perfect framework which is going to solve a very imperfect situation that you're going to be dealing with. So, so that's one. And I think that's from my perspective and from a practitioner perspective, we don't always have the opportunity to comment on the framework like we have actually you know, today. So my background is you know, I go into a situation, I have a framework, and the bank asked me basically to make the most of it. And then afterwards, I can have opinions about it and what could be better and all that kind of stuff. But I typically find myself then in another situation. And actually, this is probably one of the first times where I personally reflected on all the restructurings I've done and what could actually be done better. And the thing what, what questioned me uh, to the point in terms of having a national bankruptcy court. And, and from the one perspective of the markets, you know, if I ignore that aspect, but I find it puzzling that a sovereign at that point in time, which is so critical, would give up so much sovereignty to bind themselves to an agreement which is not basically supported necessarily by the voters. It might be a more objective agreement and a more clear agreement, but at that point in time, and it's a little bit what you see in Greece, at, at its darkest hour, you actually want to have your most sovereignty to basically do what's best for your country. And if you introduce this, this, this bankruptcy court, and assuming that everybody's going to hold themselves to it, because to a certain extent we have rules, and if everybody applies rules and follows the rules, you, know, you end up in a situation where the situation will be resolved. But I find it you know, irrespective of the market's perspective, and just looking at it from an outsider, if I would be in government, that is exactly the moment I want to be in control of my destiny and not hand over my destiny to three or four people who might not even have set foot in my country, who don't understand the country's dynamics, the people, the mentality, the origination of the problems, and I will just look at a blind set of documents and go into an interpretation and then try and 
and think about what is the best outcome here. And you take away you know, the influence you have in, in structuring your future. You might be told as a, as a sovereign, you're going to exchange, and it's going to look like this. And this is the haircut that you're going to give, and this is what everybody is going to accept. And it might well be that, you know, as a sovereign, you actually want to do more than that, or you think you need to do more, your population expects you to do more. So if I then look at it from the perspective of the market participants, is this something that the market is waiting for? I don't think, I don't think it is. I, I think... You know, and, and, and to Mr. Stiglitz's point, you know, we don't have bankruptcy laws. Why? Because to a certain extent, the fundamental issue is a country can't go bankrupt. And uh, we have bankruptcy laws because we have, in, in, in normal corporate debt restructurings, we have very specific rules because there's enforcement and, and all these kind of things. You have fiduciary duties and all these kind of things. And people who buy sovereign debt, you know, effective, and I, and I read in one of the papers, there's effectively a promissory note. There's no attachment. There's no nothing. So from that perspective, I don't think from the market's perspective this is something we would want. But... I question very much why a sovereign would want it either. Ambassador, let me ask you, uh, first of all, your view on that uh, sovereign architecture. I suspect you're in favor. I know you're in favor. Um, let me put the case for the, uh, the prosecution on this. Uh, since 1970, about 70 countries have restructured their debts. Doesn't seem to be particularly difficult. Argentina has obviously been impeded by these holdouts. But actually, isn't, isn't there an, a case that actually, for many countries, it's too easy to restructure, and creditors' rights need to be asserted more readily? Well, I, I think that uh, if you take a look to the history of sovereign debt restructurings as you were doing for the last uh, 30 years, there has been a succession of events that have been eroding sovereign immunity and that in fact have been creating the grounds for vulture funds behavior and for really attacking countries in their sovereign debt restructurings. The, this chain of events was certainly transformed last year with Judge Griese ruling. I, I believe there's been an af a before and after the Argentine debt case. And this is because countries all around the world and international institutions and also market participants have become conscious of the damage that holdout behavior can create to sovereign debt restructurings. And this is not just an issue about Argentina. In fact, the, the, the fact that there's now going on a global discussion an international process of reform related to changing sovereign debt restructurings clearly shows that this is an issue of concern for all countries around the world. It's not only the IMF, it's not only the United Nations, but the D20 leaders have stated very clearly that predatory behavior is an issue of concern and that reforms and actions need to be taken. So we're talking about a global problem and we certainly believe there needs to be a, a global solution. Of course, all the actions that could be taken and that the, John was uh, presenting in relation to making what are called vulture-proof clauses and vulture-proof contracts, we believe are positive. Whatever you can do to assure that all the creditors respect the deal that you arrive with the majority of creditors, that's very important. That's exactly what Argentina did. In fact, we reached an agreement with 92.4% of our creditors, but a small minority of around 1% decided to hold out, to not accept this uh, deal, and to in fact try to sabotage the restructuring for, for the whole. So I think that we have a problem here, that it's also an issue of concern for the markets. Because in the case of Argentina, what you see is that holdout behavior, vulture funds don't only act against sovereigns, they act against good faith and the majority of creditors. Now we have a situation in, when, in which Argentina's creditors are not being able to collect the money that Argentina paid. They are not receiving their money because there's a blockage in the collection of payments that was decided by the judge. So this is unrelated funds totally to the litigation that have nothing to do with our case, and that in fact are not getting their money, including US bondholders, including US pension funds, including US banks that are also being damaged because of the situation. So I think it's not only of interest of sovereigns, but certainly also in interest for the, for the market participants as well. M Martin, do, do you recognize that characterization? 
I think, you know... And, and that's one of the things which, when I was going through some of the literature in preparation for this, I found a little bit astonishing, is that the concept of the holdout is not something which is limited to debt markets. It's limited to equity markets. It's limited... It's, it's basically politics. You could argue that, you know, at the highest level at the United Nations, sometimes you have a holdout problem when you have a vote. So from that perspective, it is a universal thing. And what I, what I was surprised about is that nobody actually did, at least in the articles that I read, a comparative study and basically say, how do equity markets deal with holdouts? Because I, you know, I have the benefit that I've, I've worked in equity markets, I've worked in credit markets, and you know, we have issues when we do big takeovers of companies. You're going to potentially have a holdout issue, and, and there, is, there are quite, quite a lot of rules and market mechanisms in equity markets which effectively help deal with this issue, which you, know, you could see whether they could be applicable to the debt markets. And for instance, if you, if you look at how national governments manage the capital structure, the shareholder structure of some of their key, uh, key industries, where if I want to buy more than 10% of the Polish insurance company, I effectively have to go to a regulator to ask for approval. And the regulator will vet, is this a, a, a good you know, firm? Does he have honest intention? Is it well capitalized, et cetera, et cetera? And guess what? They can say no. And you know, if I look at it, and, and I'm not an economist, I'm also not a lawyer. So from that perspective, I'm very much a practitioner looking for, for practical solutions to, uh, to problems. And, and you would argue, it's like, why wouldn't you apply a similar mechanism to, to sovereign debt? If, you know, if, if people worry about concentrations of debt in the hands of people who they don't think they would welcome you know, being a debt holder in the country, then introduce similar kind of statutes and say you have to go to the central bank or a regulator saying if you want to own more than 25% of Ukraine debt, you know, ask for approval. And from that perspective, you can, can use these mechanisms to smoothen out you know, the holdout problem as we, we do in equity Joe, markets. Joe, the, I mean, the, the argument the, um, the holdouts would make is that they are a necessary part of discipline on, on uh, sovereigns. And if they weren't there, then sovereigns could behave irresponsibly. That's absurd. Uh, you know, uh, countries repeatedly have to go to the market. And the discipline is that if you don't behave well, you won't be able to get access to the market again. They may decide they don't want to access the market again. But I want to come back to, to two points that were raised earlier. One of them is you said, you know, things have worked out pretty well. Uh, but as Sean pointed out, you know, they haven't really worked out. It depends on what you mean worked out. There are two ways in which they haven't worked out. One of them is that the restructuring, and I, I want to emphasize, we use the word bankruptcy, but that's a metaphor. It's really we're talking about restructuring. So mm -hmm. that the notion that there can't be bankruptcy is not the issue. It's, it's the restructuring of debt. That they <clears throat> typically wait too long and are not deep enough. Not only do they wait too long, they're not deep enough. And we have so many cases where they go into debt uh, restructuring. Three years later, they're into another restructuring. The economy is devastated in the interim. And, and it's clearly not successful. The other question is, what do you mean by success? You know, if you have a big guy that beaks up on another guy um, and succeeds, and the other guy says, well, you know, uh, you say, well, it worked out OK. The big guy says that. The little guy may not feel that. We had a laws about slavery. That it used to be we had slavery. People would run away, and they get returned. And actually, there were discussions about these laws back uh, before the end of slavery. And the, 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 the slave owner said, these laws actually are very good. They are part of private property. Uh, slaves were property. And they, th th they worked. So in my mind, the real question is a question of equity, a question of how the market works as a whole. And um, uh, the answer to that is the current market isn't working very well. Now, part of the uh, issue that uh, pointed out, uh, issues of restructuring happen in private market, as you said, you know, equity. But there are negotiations. And those negotiations go on with the backdrop of a legal structure. And if they can't reach an arrangement, then you go to a judge. And he makes a judgment about equity. What are the fairness? Is it 1% holding out? Is there justification for their holding out? Or, uh, or is it the 99% are exploiting that 1%? So there's a framework of judging equity. Now, I, I want to also pick up a, a, a point that was raised. 
would countries agree to give up sovereignty, you know, particularly at that critical time? And to me, as I've thought about this issue and you know, discussions go on, I think maybe the appropriate way of going forward, and there's some discussion in the UN context, that, that is the essential issue that we should make sure that no contract gives the right of one country, one government, to give up sovereign immunity because they're giving it up for future governments. So when you borrow, you know, you can't sell yourself into slavery. That's a basic law. In so the same thing, one government can't bind its future uh, governments to say we are giving up our sovereignty. That would imply that the nature of the net, uh, what we really are trying to get to is what I sometimes call a soft law framework, uh, a framework where you would have mediators, you would try to set up norms that the, the, the country in the end reserves the sovereign immunity, but if you don't go along with the norms that have been established, you will have consequences about your ability to get money in the future, but there, what, we, what we need to do is to try to establish what those norms are. And the norms are just because you're a big guy, you can't beat up on a little guy. They're, they're more based on principles of equity that we, you know, that the international community uh, should to work at. Let me just make one more little point, which is I chaired an international commission uh, in the aftermath of the, of the crisis that had central bank governors and, and you know, uh, experts from all over the world. And we focused on a lot of issues, but this was one issue that we said the international community had to address. It was before Judge Grease's decision, but it, it, it was really picking up on the efforts of the IMF. I thought, we thought their initial efforts to try to develop some restructuring mechanism were right, and that the international community really need to move in that direction. Sean, can I ask a little bit about the proposals then that the IMF has uh, come forward with, um, which are uh, clearly short of what um, was put forward in the early 2000s, but still significant given uh, this is a change to the way the IMF handles its lending programs, and the IMF is uh, always going to be involved when a country gets into serious financial uh, trouble. C can, I, can I get a little bit, first of all, in terms of how this would change things and sure. how significant these reforms would be? Sure. So, I mean, just to pick up you know, on what we perceive the problem is that we're trying to fix, okay? Because it's, it's important that we, we identify what the problem is. So from the fund's perspective, you know, countries come to us generally when they've lost market access, when essentially they've got large amounts of debt that they can't refinance with future borrowing. And they've lost market access because the private sector itself has made a judgment that they're nervous that they're not going to be repaying their debt. So that's when they come to us. And clearly, they're, they're looking for fund financial assistance to enable them to repay their debt. And for the fund, our job is to basically resolve the country's underlying problems. That's the basis of what you, you all know is conditionality, not to enable them to delay the resolution, but to actually take necessary steps to address these problems. And in many cases, the, ide well, the ideal situation is where we put together with the authorities a program, an economic reform program, that with our financing actually catalyzes a return to market access. And they, all creditors get repaid on the original terms. It's called what we call the catalytic approach. And it's worked in many cases, Brazil, Mexico. But there comes a time when the fund looks at a country's debt stock and realizes that it's so large that no matter how much financing the IMF provides, no matter how much adjustment the country engages in, it will never be able to service these claims. It's effectively not illiquid, it's insolvent. Now, the problem is making the judgment as to whether a country is illiquid or insolvent. In the corporate context, it's relatively straightforward. A, a company is insolvent if its value of the liabilities exceed its assets. In a sovereign, it's more complicated than that because the assets are, in a, you know, theoretically inexhaustible because of the taxing power. 
So you have to make a judgment at what point does adjustment actually become counterproductive because it actually undermines the growth and therefore the tax base. It's also the political constraints on adjustment. But wherever that moment comes, where it, and it will always be a judgment, by the way, the judgment is that the fund cannot provide support in the absence of a restructuring. Because to delay a restructuring at that point, we're not helping the country. We're actually making it worse. Because the country is expanding the debt that it's going to have to restructure anyway. And for creditors, creditors are only becoming more diluted. So in those circumstances, it's in everyone's interest to do restructuring. So for the fund, from our perspective, what's central is that we look at a a modification of our lending framework that enables us in those, in those cases, and they are exceptional, where debt restructuring is necessary for us to basically initiate that earlier. Now, one of the specific issues that we're trying to address, and it's, a very, it's one that essentially came up in the context of Greece, is that where there's a sense that the debt is unsustainable, that's the word we use, where essentially it cannot be repaid. Should we delay a debt restructuring because of concerns about contagion? And that's, of course, what one of the concerns was in 2010. And I think fund staff, in any event, have reached the judgment that delaying a restructuring because of concerns on contagion is not only ineffective, it's actually counterproductive. Because in our view, first of all, you're not helping the country. You're actually making the country situation worse. But secondly, you're not really addressing contagion. Because our view is that contagion is generated by uncertainty. If the market feels that even with this bailout, the debt is still unsustainable, you haven't really addressed contagion. And so therefore, our view is that this idea of create an exception where we delay a debt restructuring for a because of consecutive, we should basically step away from that. And we should eliminate what's called the systemic exemption. Can I just say, I mean, Sean is exactly right. And, and there's one more dimension to this. There is a major intercreditor equity issue. Because when you delay it, the short-term creditors get out, and other people are left holding the bag. Often, the international creditors, often other long-term creditors. So, so it is both, I mean, he's absolutely right about the contagion, about the, the fact you haven't solved the problem, you get it worse. And it's also true that there are real equity issues. But this is born, obviously, of the Greek example, not wanting to repeat uh, that example. Um, the, I suppose the worry that some people express is that, um, in a sense, early restructuring could create more restructurings um, and, and more, more systemic concerns about the solvency of a particular country. The moment it seems likely that they might have to approach the IMF, creditors will start to panic, uh, and uh, there could be a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. OK, so this is a really important issue, which is um, remember that we're not saying, again, and I, you know, we, whenever you have a, a conference about restructurings, you, it, it, you generate the feeling that this is the norm. I keep wanting to emphasize it's the exception. The fund still feels it's critical that we maintain the, what we would consider the normal approach of providing financing to countries that have lost market access without a debt restructuring, right? So that the fact that a country has lost market access and comes to the fund, this change would not necessarily mean that there's going to be more restructurings. We would still have the possibility of essentially providing large amounts of funding, financing without a restructuring. What we want to do is have the flexibility in those cases where we do have concerns about sustainability to basically initiate the process. So there would be no automaticity. And if a country has already lost market access, Sam, at that point, there's not going to be really a run from the country. They've already lost market access. We're not talking about this in circumstances where countries have market access. Ambassador, how would that system have affected Argentina back in 2001? Well, Argentina was certainly one of the cases during the 1990s of 
rolling over debt once and once again, getting bigger access to the market and really getting to a very unsustainable debt. In 2002, our debt to GDP rate was 166%. The debt at the time of Argentina was unpayable. Argentina, as you know, was the poster child of neoliberal policies <laughs> in the 1990s. And to sustain the convertibility regime, more foreign debt was acquired. We were very close to the IMF at that time, as you know, and to the Washington consensus policies. We had a very serious back uh, crisis, social, political, in economic terms. And since 2003, we restructured our debt with a new president and with a new concept that I think is really a, a lesson that we can share with everybody and, and maybe with the Greeks some, uh, as well. That for <coughs> growing and for, paying a, for, a, for being able to pay your debts, you need to grow. And to be able to grow, you need to have a sustainable debt. So we had a haircut, we've been paying our debts, and now we have a manageable debt that we can pay and that we've in fact have been paying since 2005. So I think that the, the concept that debt sustainability is key for growth is very important, but also, debt, uh, but also growth is very important for being able to pay your debts. If you don't grow, there's no way you can get the resources to, to pay your debt. In our case, probably a haircut before and restructuring before would have been good, but we finally had the, the restructuring, and in fact, 92% joined. And the, and the thing that uh, this uh, shows is that Payment capacity is very important, and intercreditor equity, as was saying Professor Stiglitz, is, is also very important. In the Greek case, you can also see that the, the holdouts problem has, has been present, uh, and that the vulture funds have been present there. So I think that it's not only Argentina, it's a lot of countries that really show that we need still to have a solution for this because it's a global issue. And just uh, one minute going back to the, the issue of the international reform, I, I must say that in as much as we agree that uh, vulture proof clauses are a move forward and that we really need to, to support that work, uh, it's very important to know that there are no fully vulture proof clauses. And that, in fact, judges all around the world can change their views, can interpret clauses in a very unwarranted way, in a very extravagant way, as Judge Griese did. Maybe you know the, the story of Argentina's uh, asking in 2004, the very same judge. Judge Korea say Argentina, before the debt restructuring, asked to make a declar declaratory judgment to Judge Korea say on the interpretation of the Pari Paso clause, because at that time in the Peru case, the vultures had already been trying to make this interpretation for one. And we asked them, our lawyers, on the record, to the judge, is there any way you would interpret this Pari Paso clause as he finally did? And he said, oh, that would be very odd. So he didn't agree at that time with himself 10 years later. So basically, this means that as much as the market-based approach and the vulture-proof clauses is a positive and, and good step to move forward, we still need to think of international framework for sovereign debt restructuring, a legal framework. And that's why we are with other countries very engaged at the United Nations as well. Can I say, I was a chief economist in the period running up to Argentina's uh, 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 crisis. And I think, uh, at least my view, and I think many other people at the World Bank would have, would have said uh, they should have gone earlier, that, that it was very clear if you looked at the trajectory where they were going that an earlier debt restructuring would have been much more positive. One other thing about the Argentina debt restructuring that they did uh, that I, was very, uh, uh, very good and we supported was the introduction of GDP bonds. And one can think of introducing automatic GDP bonds, uh, automatic conversion. The IMF has ideas similar uh, to this in some of the uh, you know, uh, uh, bonds they've talked about, of, of um, ordinary bonds being converted into GDP, GDP bonds, which would be essentially like Chapter 11, where you convert debt into equity. And you know you'd have to work out the deal, but in the case of Argentina, those bonds have worked very well. In the long run, in the short run, the bond market did not like it. Uh, it was a new product, and they didn't understand it. But from an economic point of view, it was it was really the right thing to the do. The GDP bonds are only going to work if you have credible economic statistics, though. No, but but it's interesting. <laughs> the 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 distortions in the statistics in the case of 
underestimating inflation, increased the GDP and made them pay more than they uh, would have. So the incentives were distorted. Now, I do think that you, you need to have, I, I agree with you, you have to have good statistics. But, but just to make it clear, that the distortions in the case of Argentina in their inflation numbers went the other way and the, the bondholders did better. Ambassador, just your comment on that. I mean, the, the GDP bonds are obviously touted. They have been by the current Greek uh, regime as well as one way uh, out of these uh, situations. What's, what are your views on them, and especially when there are, as with your country, uh, problems with the, the statistics? Well, the, the GDP linked bonds were, as Professor Taylor said, not were very new, were uh, an innovation that Argentina put forward at that time. So at the beginning, investors were a bit uh, had doubts, but they proved to be a very successful one. And I think that the market has very clearly confirmed that they were a very good investment and they had a very good return. Argentina has been growing for uh, 12 years now at, at an average rate of 5.7%. And I, I don't want to get into the, the details of the statistics discussion, which is not a part of the panel, but certainly, I, I, as you all know, we have been doing a very positive work with the IMF and others in relation to our statistics uh, process. We are very confident uh, on, on that work, and I look uh, forward for, for everybody to, to be clear about our process. Martin, can, can I ask you, what, what, what is your assessment of the uh, impact of the IMF reforms? Were they uh, to go through? Would you worry that restructurings could happen too quickly? <laughs> what, what's from I, a I, practitioner's point of view? A, I've, I've learned not to worry too much in my uh, profession about <laughs> anything, to be honest. I, I think, you know, a couple of the comments I wanted to make, because we seem to be talking about two issues at the same time. One, I think, is the issue that Sean mentioned. Who decides when to go and do the exchange? Is it a decision? You know, bondholders will never go to a sovereign and say, you know what, let's do a sovereign debt restructuring. We, we see it's bad, and, you know, why don't we go and sit down? Is it the national government who has to make the first step, and they have, I think, the sovereignty to do it? Or does the IMF want to say, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, government that you think you can still pay. We decide that you have to go to the market and do this exchange. And then the question is, who decides what that exchange is going to look like? You know, is it going to be the IMF which says, you know, give me your 2020 bonds and I'm going to give you 2030 this haircut? Who decides? I think that is one. And then the second issue we're talking about is when such an exchange actually happens, how's the best way to get around or dealing with the holdouts? So, so from that perspective, it's, it's unclear to me what actually the proposal is, who is going to decide and, and, and push that button and say, and then after that button is pushed, who gets to decide? So let's take the case of Argentina. Would it have been the IMF who have decided to say, you're going to offer this to the market and we're going to try and help you deal with the whole that problem? Or is it a, mesh, a matter of national sovereignty that the final decision makers on what to offer is going to be actually the government? It's always the sovereign who decides. But the sovereign comes to the fund and says, mm -hmm. we would like to have financial assistance. So the fund has to make its own decision as to what conditions it's going to attach to its financing. The sovereign can walk away from those conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's really critical that we be clear that there's no sacrifice or surrender of national sovereignty here. But the fund has its own responsibility as to basically how it makes its resources available, just like any bank does. So we have a public mandate. And our mandate is to help countries resolve our problem, their problems. If we feel our resources are being used to just delay and exacerbate mm -hmm. a problem, we can't provide financing. The country is free at that point to walk away. But we have to basically manage our resources in accordance with our own mandate. But that is already the current framework as it is. Correct. And so I'm trying to understand what the new framework would add to this process. Well, so let's, a little bit of detail. So we have, you know, when the fund makes decisions about, about anything, it comes up with what we call general policies, general sort of regulations that govern the exercise of discretion by the executive board. Currently, that policy allows for the fund to compromise or at least put aside its concerns on sustainability where there is evidence of contagion. One of our proposals is to eliminate that exception.
so that contagion would not be a basis for the fund to delay a restructuring. Because our view is that that actually is a counterproductive element of our existing mm -hmm. policy. And that is a very, it's a limited change, but it's a significant change. And that's, I think, one of the central proposals. And then to your point in terms of how to deal with holdouts, I think preserv or let's say, how do you say it? Um, prevention is better than curing. I do think that how many holdouts you're going to have in a restructuring is very much dependent upon how you design the restructuring in the first place. So there is a price discovery which needs to take place. And you can argue, you know, and it's, let me take a practical example. I worked on a tender offer for 25% of a company in Austria the other day. And basically, the company that I was working for went to market and offered a very small premium. And in the end, 2% of the stock got tendered. And I could argue that 98% of the capital stock, the shareholder, were effectively holdouts. They didn't disagree. They didn't agree with the offer. So in the way that you design the offer is going to probably already tell you whether you're going to get holdouts, vultures, or whatever you want to call them. So I think there is probably too little understanding at the moment in how the design of the initial exchange that you're trying to do is going to attract people who are going to basically hold out. And that's going to be a function of price. That's going to be a function of structure. And you know the, cumulative act or the, the collective action clauses helps. But the initial point is vultures are not attracted to debt restructuring per se. They're attracted to a certain yeah. return. If you offer them 110 percent of the value, I'm sure you will get zero exactly. holdouts. <laughs> yeah, so, well, and, and, and but and that's <laughs> not the issue. You, the, you, the you issue go is into re debt restructuring because you don't have any money. You make an offer. The case of Argentina, they got, what, 90-some percent? 92%, 92 percent accepting. And you had 8% holding out. And 2%, particularly 1%, were particularly vultures and went to the US court, took advantage of a change in the legal structure in New York State. I mean, we haven't mentioned that. But how there was a change in the law that was a gift to the vulture funds and wasn't a gift. They pay for it through lobbying, so let me make it clear. They bought it. Uh, and it was a ch something called the Champerty defense, which said that, that if you buy a, uh, a, a, a uh, bond with the intent of suing to get your money back, uh, you couldn't do that. But let, me, but, but let me ask the, uh, the ambassador. I mean, th this battle has been going on for a very long time now at extraordinary cost to Argentina. Um, it continues to be, as a result, un unable to access the markets in normal terms. And yet it probably could buy these vultures off if it wanted to. Well, we, we have uh, offered the, the vultures the same offer that we have been offering all our creditors for some time. And they have rejected one and every other offer. And let me make one fact that I think is important clear. These are not investors, financial investors, that were positioned in Argentine debt before the 2001 default. These are specific funds that make their business and try to get unwarranted profits, getting uh, debt that is already in default. In the case of Argentina, they got their bonds in 2008, and they are trying to make a 1,600 profit out of uh, getting a full payment plus interest. So I think this, this shows a very specific type, type of, of behavior that really, as I said, goes against the possibility and the, the chance to get funds by the other 92.4% of our creditors. Argentina, a few weeks ago, has just uh, access uh, through domestic law bonds the financing it needs. We have been also very well funded by international organizations like the World Bank, the IDB. So we've been having the financing that we need and that we want for our infrastructure development, for our social investments. We certainly experienced it in the 1990s, the worst side of over indebtedness and of high financial speculation. So we have a very clear stance that we will access financing just for the purpose of our sustaining of our process of economic growth and of social inclusion, not just for financial speculation, not just as a means of uh, rolling over our debt. So I, I believe our case shows uh, pretty well that 
we've had the financing that we want, and we've been able to have a very reasonable level of debt. So we are not in the risk that other countries are in terms of not having the resources to pay our creditors. We have those funds. Of course, we have a litigation going on, and we want to find a solution to that. But it has to be a fair solution, a legal solution, a reasonable solution, not a solution that will cost Argentina more money and that put Argentina at more risk because it's not reasonable and, and sustainable. Um, Sean, uh, can I ask from the, the legal point of view, what have the ramifications been from where you sit, from the, uh, the, um, the district court judgment? How significant have the ramifications been? So, again, you know, we look at this from the perspective of our, you know, our mandate. And you know, where we, when we think that restructurings are needed, and we've initiated one, it's important that we have some degree of certainty that when a majority have agreed, there will be an agreement. Because actually, one of the problems is if there's uncertainty at the end of the process, that actually might also delay the initiation. So the two, the two ends of the restructuring process are related. Now, you know, in some respects, this is not unique to sovereign debt restructuring. I mean, you know, it's, it's a form of market failure when basically you don't have appropriate collective action amongst creditors. As Joe has indicated, traditionally in the sovereign context, it wasn't a significant problem because, quite frankly, the ability of holdout creditors to exercise real leverage, <coughs> legal leverage against a sovereign was limited because the assets that are available of a sovereign for attachment are limited. The novelty of what happened in Argentina is that the holdouts didn't need assets. They actually were able to get the court to stop payments to the creditors that actually had restructured. So it was very novel. And you know, they used the peri passu provision as the basis for that. So you know, from our perspective, that will, by definition, going forward, increase the risk that you'll have more holdouts, because you have, you have a strategy now. Secondly, if you're a creditor who's thinking of, being, of going into the deal, you may be worried that the payments to you are going to be actually stopped. So for those reasons, there is a concern now. How significant is this concern? And here, I think fund staff is relatively nuanced because it's not just the district court decision. It's the Court of Appeals, the Second Circuit. It's not entirely clear, and there's been a lot of discussion about this, as to whether or not this court decision is going to have broad applicability <coughs> or is somewhat limited in terms of its precedential value to the circumstances of Argentina. There's different, and the Second Circuit decision is actually somewhat difficult on this issue. And it's, it's been interpreted different way by both academics and in the market. But put it this way, the market itself has been sufficiently concerned that it is the market that has wanted to come up with new collective action clauses to address this problem. So it's not just the official sector that's worried. Creditors themselves, because you know, when they go into restructuring, from an intercreditor equity perspective, they don't want to go into it and find out that there's a lot of holdouts. So even the market has recognized that there's sufficient risk that they have actually taken it upon themselves to have a discussion about collective action clauses that address this issue. So I think it's not just an official sector perspective. It's a broad market perspective. Martin, have you seen a change in the way issuance is happening? Has issuance gravitated away from New York law uh, as a result of this uh, case? What kind of market changes has it created? Now, you know, to start with, you know, why is New York law as important as it is? And that's because <clears throat> most of the money that is available for investing in, in sovereign debt is basically in the U.S. And U.S. fund managers and, you know, they have specific views, they have regulations, they have rules that they need this framework in place in order mm -hmm. to, and it's not a judgment call they make on, on, on the, the, the legal framework in the country itself. For instance, you know, I'm a Dutch person, we have a perfect legal system, but, you know, no American, <laughs> it, we actually do, but no American <laughs> investor <laughs> will buy bonds from the Dutch law. It's not because they don't like it, uh, it's just because they don't want it. They want to stick to a certain format which they know and they don't have to defend it. So from that perspective, moving away from New York law you move away from a huge pool of money, uh, which moves away from best pricing. So from that perspective, 
we see people just coming to market on the New York law. Why? Because you're going to sell it to the funds. So then that people are sticking in it. Yeah, and, 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 and people get, get very emotional. And I remember one of my first deals I wanted to sell to you as investors. It was a fantastic deal. And he said, come back when you put it on the New York law. And I said, why? You know, that doesn't make a difference. I said, for us, it does make a difference. So the reason why we have these bonds on the US law and the UK law is because that's where the fund managers are. That's who the people who actually make the decisions. And when you actually see, and that is one of the things which is, I think, a little bit under-highlighted in some of the, the, the readings I've done is, you know, you need to follow the, the life cycle of the bond during a restructuring process. Because initially in Greece, for instance, you know, all the bonds were held by insurance companies, et cetera. And why? Because they don't have to hold capital against it, even if it has a B rating, it is triple C, et cetera, when it moves down. But you see the churning of the bonds happening. So the people who initially buy in uh, into the original issue, they're not going to be the ones sitting at the table towards the end because at some point all the, the passive investors, you know, they get scared, they start selling them. And, and that is actually a good process because it lowers... It okay, sorry, I'm going to interrupt because I'm conscious we're running low on time for questions. Just to uh, pre-announce, uh, Professor Diglis does have to leave slightly early. Um, so if you have specific questions for him, now is probably the time uh, to get them in. I'm already seeing hands going up very rapidly. So uh, let me start off here, please. Thank you. Sandra. I'm Alessandro Leipold from the Lisbon Council, Chief Economist there. Just to confuse matters, it's actually in Brussels, but it's called <laughs> Lisbon Council. And for full disclosure, um, an ex-IMFO actually way back when worked on uh, Anne Kruger's SDRM proposal. And I wax nostalgic, not just because I was a lot younger then, that's a factor, but also because I really miss the fund uh, that was taking a leading position at the time. <laughs> I think the fund is now backtracked, is too timid, is has accepted the contractual approach as a given. It may be real real politic, I realize that, but that shouldn't impede it from still making the cause for a contractual approach, I mean a, a statutory approach, uh, as the first best. And, and you know, the contractual approach that's being advocated, I don't think um, answers uh, the two uh, flaws that um, Professor Stiglitz pointed out to, to too late and not deep enough. It will be too late because if the IMF has to really find that a country as debt is unsustainable with high probability, that's a very high bar to pass. The fund doesn't <laughs> like to label countries. It never labeled anybody as being fundamentally misaligned in its exchange rate. It'll take ages before it labels anybody's debt as being unsustainable with high probability, number one. Number two, that will only then trigger what is sort of euphemistically called reprofiling. Uh, and that's not deep enough, we know that. Uh, and so I don't really see how, you know, sort of, great, it's good to play it, get rid of the, get rid of the, um, what is it, the contagion clause that should have never been approved in the first place, uh, and, and, and fiddle around with collective action clauses and other things, but it's not gonna solve the fundamental problem. Let me take, um, thanks Sandro, <laughs> can I take another question, and we'll just do a couple. Um, yes, please. Question. My name is Monica Huda, and the question is for Professor sorry, Stiglitz. Could you, sorry, could you identify My name is Monica Huda uh, from Georgetown University, and okay. the question is for Professor Stiglitz. And I'm, I'm just, I keep thinking about the lesson, the political lessons of the Argentinian crisis. And uh, I was wondering what do you have to think if uh, the Nestor Kirchner wasn't so um, aggressive uh, uh, in, in its... Uh, in his debt restructuring, if it were if it were less uh, uh, belligerent, uh, do you think that the U.S. government would have a better will, power, will, goodwill toward uh, what's happening now? You know, because it's, the government here is pretty much silent, and it's it's a uh, court decision that is creating so much so counterproductive to the markets. And uh, I wonder why the government silence. Do you think that the national Kushner's way of dealing with the, that restructuring is a, is a factor in that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, let, let me take those two um, uh, and in reverse order. So perhaps, um, Joe, if you could start with the latter okay. question, and Ambassador, you could chime in on that as well. Yeah. Um, I think the answer uh, is it would not have made any difference. I and mean, you talk about less aggressive. If you include the, both the, the, the fact, the haircut that it demanded, plus the GDP bond, 
and you look what the bondholders gotten, it's very similar to what people have gotten in other debt restructuring. But using the GDP bond gave it the flexibility that it enabled it to grow at 8% from the time of the restructuring to the 2008 crisis, which is what, it was one of the fastest growing countries in the world uh, after China. I think it was the number two. Uh, so, and without that flexibility, they would not uh, have been able to do that. I think the criticism of Argentina is that it stood up. And people don't like people who are uh, debtors to talk loudly. I mean, I think that's basically what it's about. And the other countries that were meeker, and you said 70%, you know, there have been a lot of restructurings. Those people who, who, who gave in easily and then had to have another restructuring three years later had an enormous uh, 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 weakness in their economy, as we've seen, for instance, in Greek, where it was not a de deep enough debt restructuring. Um, so, uh, yes, they were meeker, but it was not good for their citizens. It wasn't good for the global economy. Can I answer the first question a little bit, too, or do you want to? Okay, go on, briefly, because oh, um, I do want to go to Sean. So I agree yeah. very strongly that uh, the contractual approach uh, isn't enough, partly for the reasons that you said. Partly also is uh, we haven't had a good discussion of the difficulty of getting a good aggregation clause. Uh, aggregation is how do you add up different bonds with different exchange rates, different maturities, um, and uh, I think there's no, been no resolution of that. And what makes this particularly difficult is you have bonds in different denominations governed by different jurisdictions. In crises, exchange rates can move a lot. And if you saw that in the 97, 98 crisis, if you used the exchange rate for Indonesia before the crisis, or you use it afterwards, who was the majority of voters is totally different. So it's very, very hard. Now, you know, there are rules that you can use, but I, I, I worry about this. Ambassador, just your thoughts on the, on the Yeah, part. I think that I, as Professor was saying, Argentina stood up to its people and, and it's uh, gonna stand up to make sure that our debt is consistent with our economic growth and our uh, sustainable development policies. And, and this is very, very important for us because we went through a very severe crisis in the past and we want to make sure that the debt is not against our national interest again. I think that there's a, an, another issue that is important to, to highlight in relation to how much Argentina is a president or not. On top of what, what has been said, the fact that there are already 10 countries around the world have, that have issued debt with these new so-called vulture-proof causes shows that this is a, an issue of concern for, for all of them. But also, sometimes it's not only about the legal aspects. The precedent that is very harmful and that shows how aggressive and, and extortionary vulture funds have been is that just by showing up in some debt restructurings, like in the Greek ones, they are getting full payments against what's going on with other creditors. So sometimes they don't even need to bother to litigate, but because of the tool that now they have and that has been granted to, to them in the New York courts, and because uh, nations, sovereigns know what these funds can do in terms of harassing, harassment of governments, in terms of blocking some series of the debt restructuring, what's going on is that they have been granted a full payment like in, in the 2012 case. So I think that this shows that there's a whole dimension of financial but also political aspects of how to deal with, with this behavior and that the technical discussion is really very, very important, but also the, the political will of, of countries like it's going on to really engage and make sure that the restructurings are rational, are efficient, are sustainable and, and are fair. Thanks. Um, Sean, your views on Sandra Leipold's question yes. um, in terms of you know, uh, the, so, the, the um, timidness. The timidness good. Alessandro, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, like Alessandro, I worked on the SDRM, the Sovereign <laughs> Debt Restructuring Mechanism, for two and a half years in my life with Ann Krieger. So I, you know, at the time I was intellectually very invested in this. Um, in the, the reality, however, is that when we started this most recent wave of discussion on sovereign debt, we posed the question to our executive board and our shareholders whether or not there would be adequate support for a statutory framework. And the answer was the same answer that we got 14 years ago, which is no, 
So given the fact that there was, the, <laughs> there was not going to be adequate support amongst our membership to pursue that, we had a choice. We do nothing or we come up with more incremental approaches that are still, in our view, a significant improvement over what we have now, which is the approach that we've taken. The second point I would make is that even if you had the SDRM, Alessandro, it would not have addressed the issue of too little too late. Because ultimately, the question as to whether or not a sovereign initiates, because it is a sovereign decision, ultimately will come down to with the funds lending policies. And the funds lending policies, in my view, are at the center of the discussion of the timing. And that's where I think we need to ha have a further discussion. The ideas that I mentioned today are just the staff's thinking. The, for example, eliminating the systemic exemption. There may be others. There were those 14 years ago that wanted automatic caps on the amount of fund lending. So after a certain amount, essentially there would be no choice. The fund would have no discretion. We do not want to have a automatic approach. We think that in this area there, there is a need for judgment. But there, at the same time, we need to have criteria that do not lead us into a path where we have considerable delay. So this is an issue, Alessandro, that is not a function of the SDRM. It's a function of our exceptional access policy. And that's what we need to address. So. Thank you. I'm Arturo Porsekensky with American University. I was wondering if I understood correctly the proposals that uh, you, Professor, and uh, you have advocated. They tend to bind the creditors more tightly, right? But they're not intended to bind the sovereign more tightly, right? And what if the sovereign is the problem? What if you have a sovereign that, say, signs treaties like bilateral investment treaties and then is found to have violated them? Or they sign clauses and their contracts are found to have been violated? Are we making any progress on dealing with sovereigns? Thank you very much. Uh, in the front, please. Uh, okay, okay. You have to call. I have to call. You, Sorry. Do you have time for that? Um, Thank you very much. Um, Alex Vieta with ASCGS. It's a little bit of a follow-up to, to the previous question, and it goes to the question of sovereignty and, uh, and how to deal with a specific case, which is the case of Greece, uh, on everybody's mind, when you have a sovereign that should be the trigger, but it's actually a sovereign that doesn't own his central bank, its central bank, because the central bank is a shared one, and, uh, and you cannot really say that Greece... Uh, as well as other member countries of the Monetary Union, is a full sovereign. So can a partial sovereign trigger such an event, as well as Argentina, for instance, or is it a different case that we're dealing with in the context of the Monetary Union, especially given the backdrop uh, against which you know, we're seeing all this, this cash crunch uh, at the moment, which is repayments to your institution, the IMF, and repayments to Greece's central bank, the ECB. That's really what they're dealing with, because the maturity of uh, everything that they have received through the FSF is uh, something that is going to happen much further uh, in, in, in the future. So I, I wonder whether, you know, what views you have on that. Thank you. Sean, on the, on the second one, I'm not sure how much you can Yeah, I don't really want to get into a discussion on our ongoing negotiations with Greece. I, I would say that you know, countries surrender different dimensions of their sovereignty. It's not a binary situation. And, you know, countries will surrender when they enter into a monetary union monetary policy. But on the decision as to whether or not to restructure their sovereign debt, they have not surrendered that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to come back to the point that you had made, which is I think it's really important here that we, you know, we, we make it clear that we are talking about sovereign countries who ultimately have to make their own decisions in terms of their economic destiny. But they also, when they, when they are denied market access, they are dependent on financing from other sources. And those creditors have to make their own decisions based on their own mandate. And that's the basis of negotiations that we have. Martin, do you have any thoughts on, on the particular EMU uh, instance and also uh, on the professor from American University's question about what if, what if the sovereign itself is, is, is the problem? 
Yeah, from a <clears throat> let me give you a practical example. It was actually something I was involved with, I think, eight years ago when an insurance company came to me and they showed me a contract. They had bought an insurance company in Eastern Europe after the privatization, and they restructured it. They owned 33%, and they had a contract from the sovereign saying, under these conditions, I'm going to sell you the majority. And the sovereign refused. The sovereign said it was a different government who signed that. We don't like this agreement anymore. Uh, we're not intending to, uh, to honor this contract. And actually, we would just like you to leave, which was a pretty tough situation to be in. And especially when, when the sovereign owns the regulator, which can make your life very, very difficult. And we basically, and this was my early lesson in terms of how to deal with, with sovereigns and sovereign situations, there's not much you can do. Uh, every arbitration court we went to said, you have to honor the contract. They didn't. Every uh, time the prime minister of my country met with the prime minister of that country, was raised and said, sorry. So after two and a half years, we basically, I told the client, I said, listen, whatever is going to happen, we're not going to get it. And you're just going to have to settle, and you're going to have to move on. It's a very practical approach. Is it right? No. But does it happen? Yes, and it happens quite a lot. And it, it's a little bit a question of, and I think Mr. Stiglitz mentioned, who's the big boy and who's the small boy? Um, reality is, in every transaction I've dealt with, with governments, the people who actually sometimes work for, they are actually the small boy. Because from a perspective, there's nothing you can do. We, we had one of the biggest uh, blow-ups in derivative history take place in my country, which I helped resolve. And the sovereign came and said, you all thought there were 12 banks in a room. You all thought you had security. Guess what? You don't. And we're going to file this thing for bankruptcy in four days. There's a $3 billion loss. You're going to take a billion haircut, and you sort it out amongst yourselves who's going to be taking it. Was that the right thing to do? You know, I understand the perspective of the country. You know, and that is what I try and encourage uh, my clients in those kind of situations who, who sometimes desperately cling on to, to a contract which I said it's not going to be enforced. Uh, that's the rules. You know, to a certain extent, that is the way if, if you go into a country where you're effectively a tourist, you know, this is, your negotiating position is zero. And in the end, in, in, in the case in Eastern Europe, we settled, we got a you know, after a lot of rhetoric and a lot of, because it was a very large insurance company which we were dealing with, uh, there was a lot of rhetoric, there was a lot of, uh, you know, public interest in it. We reached an, an agreement with the government, we sold, and we moved on. And everybody, to a certain extent, was happy. So I try to encourage people to see the perspective of the negotiating position that they have, and sometimes, you know, a contract is just a piece of paper. Ambassador. Yeah, in, in our own case, if there's something that uh, the government I represent has been doing since 2003 was to move forward into normalizing and regularizing a very difficult situation in relation with our debt that was the result of the 2001 default. We moved forward in, in paying and establishing, settling all our debts except this very specific group that we have been discussing today, which is the, the Belcher funds that don't want to accept Argentina's offer. So I certainly agree what has been said that the decision to restructure needs to be a decision by the sovereign, but it has to be, and it can be compatible with honoring its international debts. In fact, in our case, we, we paid all our debt to the IMF in, in 2006, which we couldn't do before in the 1990s, in which we were rolling over our debt. So in fact, a good restructuring was absolutely compatible with honoring the debts, paying the debts, and, and moving forward in, in our uh, process of economic growth. Thanks. Uh, next second. question towards the back, please. Hi. Uh, Rob Shapiro from Georgetown, Sonicon, and ETFA. Thank you. Um, let me say I find it a little peculiar that sovereigns are being presented as the kind of weak party here as against individual investors whether they're hedge funds or pensioners. In the case of Argentina, the holdouts include tens of thousands of individual pensioners in Italy. But the main point I want to make here is that <clears throat> the more you constrain the rights of lenders, uh, the less likely lenders are to enter into that market. That the ultimate result of this 
will be a reduction in the availability of global funds for developing countries. And the countries which will be harmed the most will be the poorest countries. Um, one last point. For example, you know, Argentina, in floating the bonds that uh, had to be restructured, explicitly chose to not have a collective action clause, explicitly chose to give up sovereign immunity in that case in order to get a better interest rate. It was an economic decision. The same kind of dynamic will occur as you constrain the rights of lenders uh, in favor of uh, sovereign borrowers. Thanks. Uh, another one, please. Not at the moment. Okay. Um, Sean, can, I take, can you take that one from Bob Shapiro? I mean, do you, do you end up um, having a sort of self-defeating self effect from these reforms in the end? Not really, because I actually I kind of agree with what you said, which is that we don't want to have a system whereby we are creating a framework that allows for strategic defaults. That's the last thing we want. You know, the, fun, the IMF's perspective is that we want to basically promote sovereign debt as an asset class. We want, we want basically credit to flow into you know, the sovereign countries. So we want restructurings to be exceptional, to be really only when absolutely necessary. But those times will come. Those times will come. And when they come, the, when they come, the question is, how do you do it? That's what we're talking about here. And I, but I, I agree that we should avoid a situation where default becomes a painless process. Um, essentially, we think it's important to support sovereign debt as an asset class. And you know, it's like any insolvency system in any country. You want to have a system that ultimately encourages the flow of credit. Right? And it's only to be used when, essentially, there is no capacity to repay. So we're talking about that. And I, I, I know I said that a number of times, but given your question, I want to emphasize that. Ambassador. Yeah, I think that sometimes uh, here in, in Washington, some people turn to present defaults. And they did this in the case of Argentina in a very unfair way, as some, some sort of like wild party in which a country just enjoys going through. And that's an absolutely irresponsible way to present it. We've been through a default as a country. It was our, the our toughest period of our history in terms of economic, social ways. Our in, uh, poverty levels were over 50%. Unemployment rates were over 23%. So it's not a, a good thing. And we went through that default because of the policies that the, the governments uh, at the times really were very unsustainable and in fact very much celebrated by the international community at that time. We moved from that since 2003 we have a different model and we have been in fact providing a very attractive and profitable investment offer for our investors both in terms of our FDI investors and our financial investors that have been getting a very good return from our uh, bonds, performing bonds. The bonds that are currently under discussion, of course, didn't have collective action clauses because they were issued in 1994. Those are the bonds that people like, the one that uh, made a common are litigating against Argentina, bonds that at that time were, according to the international practice, and in fact, in 2003, there's been a new trend of new bonds with new clauses that has proved 10 years later that, not, that was not enough, in fact, to protect countries. So now we're having a new trend of new bonds and clauses that are recommended by international capital markets. So I think that leaves me, again, to the conclusion that there are no fully vulture-proof clauses. There are no clauses that you can really include in your bonds that will fully protect you. Because in, in, in this case, what we saw is a judge that made a, a decision that, in fact, was a, a scandalous change of the rules. That was not only against market practice, and that's why the International Capital Markets Association and so many market practitioners questioned. The US government itself explicitly mentioned that it was against the market interpretation of the Paris Passu clause, but also we believe against international law because the remedy that was crafted interfered with funds that against, against sovereign immunity. And in fact, it has been an expropriation of third party rights and related good faith uh, creditors from Argentina that have been 
blocked from collecting the, their bonds. So I think the, the discussion is much more sophisticated and, and it's, it's good to, to have it here, but, but certainly talking about 1994 bonds, it's a pretty, a pretty misleading way to, to present the, the issue. Awesome. I, I think the gentleman makes a, makes a very good point, and that's one of the things which I missed a bit in, in, in reading up on, on the topics, is that people talk about, okay, we would like to have this, this thing in place, but there's very little debate about what's it going to cost. And what's it going to cost, not in terms of having an organization to do that, but the fact that what you're alluding to is, you know, our, our bond spread's going to go up 1%, you know, effectively. And are effectively the poorer countries are going to, who have no intention of defaulting, because I think there are approximately 160 countries which issue foreign law denominated debt. Not all of them plan to default. I hope most of them don't. Uh, but there are typically two or three. And, and then the question becomes if you go into a new framework, uh, which is different, are you going to a, alienate the current investor group, which basically means the, the, the amount of money that is available is going to shrink, and as a result, you're going to increase interest cost? Uh, and two, um, I'll let, yeah, let me just park it there. Is, is that, because it's, I miss it completely in all the readings. I did read a report from Moody saying it's not going to impact the credit rating because our credit rating is, is driven by likelihood of default, not in terms of what the recovery effectively is. But the reality is you're going to be fishing in a smaller pond. And that is something you want to avoid because, you know, the best interest of a country is to have the lowest possible interest because from, from the perspective of... Um, uh, of the country, every dollar you save on not paying interest is one you can spend on the economy. So it, it, it's not really clear to me if anybody did add it to sums, if you have 900 billion of, uh, of sovereign debt, you know, if it's going to cost you a percent in spread widening, that's going to be 9 billion a year. Is that the price worth paying for having maybe a little bit more robust framework around the one or two cases that default? To, to the point of the ambassador, I, I, I sympathize. Um, you know, I work at a bank, you know, we get bad court judges all the time. Actually, very few, you know, judgments we ever got were actually favorable towards the bank. So when you go through this process of having a judge, it's a very risky thing, effective, to let it come to fruition. That's why there is actually very little case law, because none of them actually come to that final moment where a final judgment is effectively made. People. Prior to that, when they kind of assess, and we do that as a bank as well, when we are in court proceedings, et cetera, you're going to have an inkling in terms of, am I going to win or am I going to lose? And there's very little case, and that's one of the reasons I think there's so much written about Argentina, because there's so little else to effectively write about, because most people don't let it come to the full life cycle. You, you walk away. There was actually probably one case this year in Europe uh, where it actually went to a judgment. Most people go through this process, then sit in a room, and you avoid a final judgment. And that avoids setting precedents and other interpretations, like, you know, and that, that we all have to worry about, you know, how is this going to impact? You know, it shouldn't come to that point. We never let it come because you never know with a judge. It's, uh, it's highly unpredictable. You know, you might have been divorced the day before, he is in the back. You know, it's. You don't want to let it come to a decision of a person who wasn't there at the time and who is not from the country. And, and, and I fr get frustrated as a banker sometimes when I see some of the cases I have to, to work out and I, see, and I actually read the court judgment and sometimes they come to the right conclusion but th through a detour which is like, how did you think of, of that? And it, it's understandable because it is a... He wasn't there at the time, and, I, and I'm, I'm very passionate about that. You know, these things should be resolved by the people who were there at the time, not by an independent arbiter who, you know, has has all sorts of views or political ideas or, or anything like that. I, I strongly recommend, as a banker, to avoid these kind of things. <laughs> banker says avoid avoid lawyers and judges. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, perhaps on that note, I'll um, call the debate to a close. There's, as I said, 70 restructuring since 1970. I'm sure we can all agree there are many more ahead of us. So this uh, <laughs> debate will continue to rage on. But as it does, could you? Please uh, uh, join me in thanking very much our distinguished panel. Thank you.